This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So I study ice cores and uh, I am just an armchair admirer of the people who study uh, evolution of humans. So I'm very pleased to be invited here and I hope I can contribute uh, something. My outline is that first I'll take a little sort of digression away from the topic of human evolution just to give you some uh, background on what's happening right now and how for example, do we know that humans are causing the current climate change? And then I'll talk about the, the observations made by many other people, not myself, that um, agriculture seems to have originated precisely when we had the, the most recent of these abrupt climate change events, 11.7 uh, thousand years ago. Some, some people call that the end of the Younger Dryas period. And it's really uh, quite, a stunning coincidence, and it probably isn't a coincidence. Many people now believe that the warming and the wetting allowed uh, humans to switch from a hunting and gathering mode of existence to an agricultural uh, mode of existence. And then I'll go on to talk about um, abrupt climate change itself and, and what causes it. I'll to tell you the punchline, which is that we think it's the switching on and off of ocean circulation. And I'll wrap up with the question, will it uh, happen again in the future? So my little digression, the smoking gun of human causation. I love this diagram and you don't see it in the media uh, very often. And I, I think it's, it's just a shame that we don't because it really is a, a very powerful uh, form of evidence, and if someone asks you if you believe in global warming, you should say no, because it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. So this is from the ice cores, I'm proud to say, this is my field of ice core science. We know from the bubbles trapped in the ice cores that CO2 in the atmosphere was at about 280 parts per million for most of the last thousand years. And then right around the time of major uh, coal burning uh, around 1850, it started to creep up. And so here we are today at 400 parts per million. And at the same time, this rare isotope of carbon that Peter Domenical introduced to you, carbon 13, 
in the, the atmospheric CO2 from a change from a very stable value. Don't worry about these units. And, and it started taking a nosedive, and that's the signature of fossil fuel burning. If the CO2 was coming from the ocean, which is the major natural source of CO2, it would not have done this. It would have been flat. So this really is the smoking gun. You can say that uh, with great, great confidence. And of course, there's a lot of other lines of evidence, but I, I like this one in particular. The other thing that you can do if you're confronted by someone who doesn't buy this argument <coughs> that you know CO2, how do we know that CO2 actually causes climate change? You can look to our neighbor uh, Venus, which has about 3,000 3, times more CO2 in its atmosphere than, than our planet. And it has a surface temperature of 450 degrees centigrade, which is hot enough to melt lead. So uh, it's basically a combination of Venus, uh, basic physics that tells us that CO2 traps heat, and these undisputed uh, measurements of CO2 concentration and its isotopes. Those three things taken together pretty much sums it all up. Everything else is kind of details. We know that uh, humans are embarking on a dramatic uh, uh, future change of climate, it's, it doesn't really matter that much what's happened up until now. I mean, asking whether the Earth is warming or not is kind of like driving towards a cliff and asking, are we dropping yet? You know, it's, it's not really that interesting a question, actually. And while I'm on the topic um, of smoking guns, this is a very famous picture that many people have seen, the CO2 concentration from ice cores, and here we are today at 400. So you see it is quite unusual in the context of the last 800,000 years, which is the, the whole ice core uh, record. I'm, I'm working on trying to extend this back to 1.5 uh, million years. And you can ask me about that later if you want. But the important thing about this, that this is not the smoking gun of human causation. There's been an awful lot of confusion about this. Uh, Al Gore, bless his heart, I think kind of led us down the wrong path by implying that this was some kind of evidence for uh, that CO2 causes climate change. In fact, it's mostly the other way around that, that uh, Antarctic temperature is related to the things that control natural variations in CO2. And the current uh, CO2 spike has nothing to do with these variations. It's not coming from the ocean, as you saw from the carbon-13 evidence is coming from fossil fuel. It's a completely different chemical, in fact. So if somebody gives you a hard time about the fact that the CO2 uh, changes uh, slightly after the, the temperature, you can tell them that's expected because it's natural CO2 and it's responding to climate. It's not causing climate. And a related myth is that the ice core record that you've just seen shows that carbon dioxide rose after temperature began warming at the ends of ice ages, which is true. That's why it's in black. Ergo, carbon dioxide does not cause warming, which is false. The fact is that ice ages are ended by the changes in the Earth's orbit, as you heard earlier today. So it's not surprising that the temperature changes first. And you can think of CO2 as a feedback that amplifies the initial warming by about 30% probably. It's not a huge, it's not actually a huge uh, increase. It's maybe, you know, two degrees bigger of a change than, than you would have gotten otherwise. So humans are adding CO2 directly to the atmosphere, and so ice ages are not a good analog. It's a red herring. And just, I couldn't resist showing this because it's such a nice analogy. If you overspend your credit card, you go into debt, then you have to pay interest, right? and then makes more debt, okay? So interest lags debt. How do we know that interest adds to debt? We can't explain the total size of the debt without taking into account interest, and also economics tells us. And climate of the past now, we have the Earth's orbit causing warming, making CO2 rise as the ocean uh, warms and outgasses CO2, and that causes further warming as an amplifier. Okay, so that's the the whole end of story about uh, human-caused climate change. Now I'm going to move on to this idea that the first um, evidence for agriculture uh, was seen during this abrupt warming. So this is a, a fascinating uh, topic, and it was mostly, I think, the work of Brian Baird, who used to be here at UCSD, 
you know, who discovered that the their very first domesticated uh, plants, I think they were barley uh, seeds actually, um, were occur within plus or minus 200 years of this abrupt warming event right here. Seeing it, this is actually the Greenland temperature, but it's a, a lot of the Northern Hemisphere European temperature as well. And then this is a, a methane, atmospheric methane record from the ice core, and it seems to be a proxy for wetness. So there's a great deal of increase in, in Northern Hemisphere low latitude rainfall at this time. And this all happened in about 30 years. These are very fast events. There was about, about half of the temperature change, change seems to have occurred in one year. So these are the kinds of things that, that could impose very large uh, stresses on uh, humans, potentially, because it's not, there's not enough time to adapt. And so what's amazing about this is that people seem to have completely changed uh, in a very short time their, their mode of existence from uh, hunting and gathering uh, to farming right here. And it, it's probably because everything got so much uh, warmer and wetter that it was just really lush. Think about the Garden of Eden, okay? So that's probably sometime in here. We don't know whether it was 8,000 years or 12,000 years, whatever. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, that was a, a, an example of abrupt climate change that probably greatly benefited our ancestors. Uh, of course, when, when it's cooling, it's drying as well, and that would be a period of intense stress, and there were probably uh, population bottlenecks at the time, and those may be very important for evolution because if you kill off 97% of the humans and the, you just leave 3%, those will have uh, characters that uh, will then be able to spread widely without having to exchange with um, a large gene pool, and so you can get very powerful uh, evolutionary change through these bottlenecks. And what's remarkable about these abrupt events is they happen again and again. There's not just one of them, there's 25 of them in the last 100,000 years. And probably, you know, something like 20 in the, in the, the 100,000 years before that. And so all, all told, our ancestors probably went through at least 100 of these bottlenecks. So it's a repeated form of, of boom and bust. And, and uh, William Calvin, had a very nice uh, book about this kind of boom and bust uh, evolutionary uh, pumping hypothesis. I'm gonna switch now to talk about the, the physical science understanding that we have about abrupt climate change, what causes it in the first place. And as I hinted at the beginning, it's something to do with ocean circulation. Warm water at the surface in the North Atlantic is carried by currents to a, this place around Greenland where it becomes cold and dense enough to sink and then it travels southward uh, you know, along the bottom of the ocean. And what this seems to do is it actually displaces the Earth's thermal equator uh, north of the geographic equator. And so the northern hemisphere today is quite a bit warmer than the southern hemisphere. And um, we believe that from theory and evidence that this circulation is capable of shutting off. And so that's what a, a cooling is. And when it turns back on, that's what an abrupt warming is. And so this is kind of what the paleo records look like of this phenomenon of shutting on and turning on and shutting off the North Atlantic circulation. In northern records, you see abrupt warmings at the, the times when the circulation goes on. And in, in the southern hemisphere, this is Antarctica, you actually see a, a, a gradual warming during times when the north is cold and then a, an inflection point towards uh, cooling, uh, gradual cooling. Um, in, the, in the south. And this is um, very strong evidence that this really is the ocean circulation. This is from a, a very recent uh, ice core we drilled that ju just finished and we got published in, in Nature uh, a few weeks ago. And th this is the, one of the main findings from this ice core is that be because we can now date the, the two hemispheres relative to each other to a precision of about 50 years, we can show that the, the northern abrupt warming leads the southern transition to cooling, which is shown here, by about 200 years. And that's very interesting because that, that really confirms that this is the ocean circulation that is doing this. So I think it, it's a, the latest in a long line of uh, pieces of evidence that support the notion that the, it is this ocean circulation sort of oscillating and flipping on and off that does this. Will it happen again in the near future? Is an abrupt climate change something we have to worry about? Well, you may have 
seen the, the movie the, the Day After Tomorrow. And that, so it's something that's permeated into the public consciousness. But I think the answer is um, probably not. And the reason I say that is that the Atlantic Ocean is getting saltier today. In the last 50 years, it's increased its salinity dramatically. You can sort of see that in this cartoon here. The Atlantic is all yellow, which uh, is an increase in salinity. The Pacific has a lot of blue, and that means sort of a decrease in salinity. So what's going on right now is that the Atlantic is getting saltier, the Pacific is getting fresher, and that's exactly what we expect to happen in a warming world because warm air holds more water vapor. And so it's possible to transport more vapor out of the Atlantic uh, into the, the Pacific across Panama, you see here. And so, so basically, whenever the world gets warmer, the Atlantic gets saltier, and the salt actually densifies the water, makes it easier to sink, and it actually protects that circulation. So, so while there was some worry maybe 15 years ago that the uh, Atlantic circulation would shut down due to global warming, I think we can say now uh, we've learned something, science moves on, um, it is now very unlikely that this will happen again. And the other thing, of course, is that um, we don't have the amplifying factor of, of sea ice. Sea ice makes the, the ocean turn from dark to white, and so it greatly exacerbates the, the effects of the uh, overturning circulation shutting off. So my take home messages, uh, hope I've convinced you that abrupt climate change uh, did stimulate uh, farming, and uh, it's a very, very interesting story that's only just uh, beginning to be understood. It's very probable that many, many abrupt climate changes prior to this one that stimulated farming uh, played a role by creating bottlenecks that, that made uh, the survivors of this event um, able to, to radiate out um, into an empty niche after the event. Um, and very, very probably, I think, also in, uh, encouraged people who could do things differently than their parents were, were doing them. And, and as I have some kids who are becoming teenagers, I know a lot about this sort of oppositional, don't do what your parents were doing kind of stuff. And I just wonder if maybe, the, maybe the, that teenager kind of thing has its origins in abrupt climate change. <laughs> Because, you know, if, if your parents are telling you to eat fruit and the climate just crashed and you say, well, I'm, I do things differently than my parents. I'm going to eat roots instead of fruits. Well, you might be the one who actually survived because you're a root eater. So I'm just wondering if maybe these population bottlenecks somehow encouraged uh, sort of contrarian thinking, you know, sort of uh, Atlantic Ocean. Overturning circulation is the culprit, I think, we can say now, that causes abrupt climate change. Will it happen again in the future? Probably not. <clears throat> That's one thing we can breathe easier about. Check that one off the list. More salt, uh, less sea ice in our future. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of the transition talk between the relatively deep past and the, um, the, the very recent past and present and future. So uh, there is a debate going on about this. I'm talking about the last 10,000 years when agriculture developed. There's a debate going on or discussion going on in the community. Uh, if you asked the average geoscientist, uh, are humans now in control of the world? the atmosphere, the water, the soil, everything else, I think you'd get pretty much 100% uh, response, yes. The debate or discussion is about whether to define a particular time when that began. And on that, there's less uh, unanimity. And I'm somewhat towards one extreme of that argument. I was asked to uh, write a perspective piece in science. I, this is not the most exciting slide in the world, but uh, <laughs> you can at least read the title. Uh, and it's about this discussion about, about this defining this epoch we live in, uh, whether, whether to do it in a very recent time. And there's a proposal out from a group um, in London 
uh, geologists, stratigraphers, to make it the 1945-1950 era because all kinds of things started to happen that humans hadn't been doing before then, and because bomb testing began then and these isotopes that people have been talking about uh, were spread widely in the ocean, uh, in the uh, ocean sediments and in ice cores. And so there's a move afoot to say the Anthropocene, the start of the human domination of the planet, is in the 1950s. And this slide shows a dark colored bar down the right center part, which uh, defines that era. It's actually, it shows the industrial era, which is the last 200 years. And there's substantial support for this uh, suggestion to do this. However, uh, th those of us who um, work back on somewhat longer time scales favor a longer interval of human influence on the Earth, uh, extending back about 10,000 years to the, the uh, earliest uh, major domestication and dispersal of crops and livestock, and, and a series of things that happened and accelerated uh, since that time. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to take you back uh, 10,000 years and tell you what we were up to um, as we became agricultural people. There's been a community since. This is a kind of a cartoon version that I drew, drew about five or six years ago of the little figure that's in the right insert on your program. And it's pretty close. Uh, it's, it's a schematic. You notice that nice wrinkle in the uh, deglaciation point. So you're coming from glacial cold temperatures up into interglacial, the modern interglacial warmth. It peaks out and then it starts to decline very slightly uh, towards, towards the, uh, the present and now we're taking off into, into worlds unknown with the uh, industrial revolution. That's, this is the picture of climate for the last 20,000 years that prevailed through the 1900s, right to the turn of the century. Here's a picture that I think is correct. It's, you notice it's the same from the glacial cold era coming up into the warmth, but around 8,000 8, years ago in this slide, uh, something else starts to happen. You see agriculture originating at the bottom of the uh, slide, and agriculture uh, produced greenhouse gas effects. There's no disagreement about that, but there's big disagreement about how much uh, the amplitude of these greenhouse gas effects. And so the proposal is that, that these anthropogenic greenhouse gases kept the climate from getting as cold as it would have without the gases, and that in fact, early farming stopped nature from taking us back into the beginnings of a new glaciation sometime in the last maybe 2,000, 3,000 years. So early farming stopped the glaciation. It sounds radical, but I'll take you through the, uh, the steps. There are two ways to think about this. So these are greenhouse gases that are recorded in ice cores, as you have already learned. Uh, the air in the ice cores preserves the amount of greenhouse gases. And here are two examples of this. Uh, the red dots show for methane at the top, carbon dioxide at the bottom. Those are the values during the last uh, 11,000 years, the time scale along the bottom. And you see them b both peaking, methane and carbon dioxide peaking about 10,000 years ago, starting to decrease and then climbing. Carbon dioxide comes back up after about 6,000 years ago. Methane comes back up after about 5,000 years ago. Also plotted on this uh, slide in blue, dark blue circles, is an average of the seven previous interglaciations. And you've seen that there were about every 100,000 years there was an interglacial climate due to those variations in Earth's, Earth's orbit. And you see that uh, starting with methane, there's a peak in methane about the same time as the red circles for this interglaciation. Then there's a decrease, not dissimilar to this, this interglaciation. But then, instead of turning around and going up, 
this average of all seven previous interglaciations keeps going down. And the same thing happens for CO2 with an even more striking match of uh, the current interglaciation and the average of the uh, previous interglaciations. And they part ways about 6,000 years ago. So I call this top-down evidence for a human in influence. And, the, and the, uh, the way to think about it is really simple. If, if the blue circles show previous interglaciations, interglaciations when no one thinks humans were having massive effects on, on Earth's environment or its atmosphere. If blue is natural, the, uh, and if blue is going down, then red is not natural. And so something new is working in this interglaciation. So something that I say that humans are doing 6,000 years ago starts to push the CO2 curve upward and starts to put the, push the methane curve upward about 5,000 years ago. Some anomalous, and I say anthropogenic, uh, factor is at work. Now, that, I call that a top-down view because it's from the point of view of the atmosphere. And that's half, half of a hypothesis. If you want a full hypothesis, you need bottom-up evidence. What's happening on the ground? What are people actually up to? This, uh, slide is a very uh, simplified version of the spread of agriculture. Uh, you can see, and, and here I'm mapping mainly the spread, not the initial uh, domestication of crops and livestock. You can see in Southwest Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean, after about 9,000 years ago, uh, crops which originated in the Fertile Crescent started to spread across Europe, came down to the Nile River Valley, went uh, east, into Pakistan and India. About the same time in northern China, people domesticated crops and animals, and that spread the beginning of the Han Dynasty, uh, uh, what the Han people, I should say, spread uh, up into Korea and then in the rest of China. And then around 5,000 years ago in southern China, the development of irrigated rice spreads across down into India, down into Southeast Asia, the Philippines. Uh, so those are major centers of domestication. Around 5,000 years ago, the Bantu people in, in uh, tropical North Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa developed sufficiently impressive ag agriculture that they spread all across Southern Africa, except for uh, South Africa itself, one of the major migrations of uh, human history. Over in the Americas, in Mexico, even though agriculture be began earlier, by 4,000 years ago, the combination of corn and beans and avocados and tomatoes, people were spreading uh, agriculture up into North America and down through Central America. And finally, in the uh, Eastern uh, Andes and part of the Amazon, uh, more agriculture beginning there 4,000 years ago. All of these are happening during the time when those greenhouse gas trends are going the wrong way. So to go back to the methane curve shown at the top, remember there the departure is 5,000 years ago. Here's a map of the spread of rice agriculture through Asia. It, it originates in the, in the Yangtze River Valley and it, it around 5,000, by 5,000 years ago, rice is fully domesticated and it spreads down into uh, the rest across the rest of Asia by 1,000 years ago. And this is based on archaeo uh, botanical work. Now, rice paddies are man-made wetlands, and wetlands are basically swamps, which have swamp gas, which is methane, which bubbles out of the rice paddies. So the spread of rice agriculture is, coincides nicely with the, uh, the reversal of the, the methane trend. The man who did this, which is, who is Dorian Fuller at University College London, converted that, the spread of rice and then an assumed uh, infilling of the density of rice into estimate, estimates of total rice area irrigated, that's in green, and he converted that using modern relationships to estimates of uh, uh, the effect on atmospheric methane, and he got a 70 parts per billion estimate between 5,000 and 1,000 years ago. The ice core data, which I showed you earlier, shows 100 parts per billion rise. So if his estimate's right, and there are gonna be more uh, versions of this, I'm sure, uh, rice irrigation would explain 70% of the rise of 
the methane trend. Remember also the full anomaly also would include the fact that the methane trend should have gone down, but it didn't, so there's more to explain. Dorian Fuller also mapped the spread of uh, livestock across Africa and Asia, and you see that between 7,000 and 5,000 years ago, the uh, livestock are in relatively arid areas. The Sahara, which is greener than, <laughs> it, has, it has grasslands because it's, it's getting some moisture. Uh, the Iranian plateau in western China. But between 5,000 and 1,000 years ago, rice spreads all the way across India. Uh, livestock spreads across India and uh, Eastern Asia and down into South Africa with that Bantu migration. So there will be estimates of the uh, methane contributions from livestock too, and they, they will explain more of the anomaly. Carbon dioxide at the bottom until recently has been very tricky for a number of reasons which I can't go into in this talk, but there's been a, uh, an explosion of data in the last three or four years that bears on this. Now, to, to get carbon dioxide from farming, just simply, you need to clear trees and burn them or just let them rot, which puts the CO2 in the atmosphere. Here's a map of the spread of agriculture across Europe, beginning on the lower right in, in the Fertile Crescent and spreading all the way to uh, the far reaches of, of Europe by 5,500 years ago. Interesting point, 5,500 years ago is still the late Neolithic, the late Stone Age. We don't even have Bronze Age tools, but people are coming in, clearing forests. They're using flint, very sophisticated flint axes. And uh, so there is agriculture all across Europe by 5,500 years ago, which is that CO2 curve is, starts, to, starts to rise by 6,500. That doesn't begin to prove that carbon dioxide explain, uh, that the deforestation explains the car carbon dioxide rise, but a paper published earlier this year suggests that uh, certainly points in that direction. The, the, uh, the top left panel shows a, a synthesis of, of hundreds of cores, lake cores that have pollen remains, which include remains of grass pollen, tree pollen, and then intermediate uh, uh, pollen, that's uh, shrubs and things uh, that are in between. And if you look at the trend in part B, uh, the dark green forest uh, pollen starts to decrease somewhere between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago, which is just after that carbon dioxide curve starts to turn up and go the wrong way. Uh, and before you get to the industrial era, you've basically gotten rid of the forest. So this, this is favorable to an early anthropogenic effect, a large early anthropogenic effect. And as the top right slide shows, it's uh, based on hundreds, of course. Part C and D shows some data from uh, China, not uh, pollen data, uh, but numbers of archeological sites. It turns out that the Chinese government for decades has been of funding people to, to gather information on the impressive early history of China. And uh, there, there's just thousands and thousands of data point, archeological data points, either radiocarbon dated or correlated by cultural remains to other sequences that are, are dated. So the, the bottom left slide shows uh, the number of archeological sites 8,000 to 7,000 years ago, and they're mostly down in the Yangtze, uh, down in the Yellow River Valley, and they're fairly sparse. By 5,000 to 4,000 years ago, the Yellow River Valley is just completely filled in. There are people burning coal in some of these areas because the forest is gone, and it's coming down into the uh, Yangtze River Valley, and this is before that rice uh, spread begins in southern China and the rest of Asia. So. Uh, I guess I could summarize by saying in the last three or four years, there's been an explosion of evidence, ground truth evidence that people are doing thing that, things that are putting a lot of, of uh, methane and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is beginning to gather some attention from those who report the scientific news. This is from Science, uh, autumn 2013. Uh, this is a piece that a commentary that focused on uh, methane and you, you can read the title and 
get the punchline yourself. Here's a paper that was published, uh, a features piece that was published in the other most distinguished journal, that's Nature. And the, the central panel shows the time of major effects, cultural effects on uh, land clearance and vegetation. And you see that there are blocks there that are dating back to 5,000 years or more. You also see that methane reversal plotted in the, the curve at the bottom right. So as we go off in the next few talks after the break into talking about the major things that have happened during the Industrial Revolution and during the last 50 years, keep in mind that we have a long history of, uh, of affecting climate and uh, the, the scope of it is still coming into focus, but it's coming into focus uh, pretty fast. I think humans have been a major effect, uh, factor on the landscape for thousands of years, not just 200 years. <laughs> I am, in fact, literally the bridge between the past and uh, the future <laughs> in many different ways. And so uh, this is the title that I originally chose when I submitted my first abstract. But as I got to preparing it, I thought I would try something new with the same material that I've been working on for some time. So I've rechanged the name now, uh, Anatomy of a Climate Regime Change. and. Uh, <laughs> It's the same material, basically, but the hypothesis is that we may be, with our modern instrumentation, over the last 20 or so years, we may be seeing a change in climate that is something like those that might have caused Jeff Severinghouse's abrupt transitions. And I'm going to go through uh, it with you. It is, of course, a very small version of very big events that happened in the past. So I first got interested in this problem because of an issue of public uh, awareness and, uh, and policy. The issue is called, the, the public issue is called the paradox, uh, the triple, the, uh, the hiatus paradox. You can, if you cherry pick your data, as this article did, you can find a time in 1997, another time in 2012, when uh, the Earth's temperature was the same that it had been. And uh, this led to the idea that the globe is not warming, even though the carbon dioxide is increasing. So I began to ask myself two other questions. That what else was going on while the global temperature was constant? Was climate change also disappearing? And I found, of course, two other paradoxes. Why are the extreme events in climate increasing? And here's the key issue. Why is the Arctic, Arctic warming even more rapidly? So let's first of all uh, verify that uh, the, this is the hiatus. It started in uh, the year 2000. And uh, during that time, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide has increased. And humans have added about 27% more CO2 than they have uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this should have led to. Uh, a increase in the warming rate in climatologist language of four tenths of a watt per meter. So we were putting more energy into the climate, but it wasn't turning up in the global temperature. And the question was, where was that energy going? So here's a longer perspective on the, on the hiatus. This is a, a record since 1880, and it shows the much shorter record than you've seen thus far, but it shows the uh, global temperature evolution. And uh, the first thing you notice is that there was another hiatus uh, about uh, between 45 and 75. They do happen. They are features of climate models. They are areas where the climate goes through a reconfiguration. Our present hiatus started with a bang, with a huge El Nino in 1997 and 8, my first year of, as director of Scripps when my office was inundated. Uh, and then you can see the profile of the slowing warming that we've seen uh, throughout this century. Now, the global mean temperature that the scientists calculate is taken from data. And most of it is from satellite observations of the sea surface temperature. And the sea covers 70% of the Earth's uh, surface. 
So you would expect that this computation uh, will be dominated by what's happening in the uh, ocean. And after uh, many gyrations, the community came to realize that it was the ocean, it's the behavior of the ocean that uh, was responsible for this hiatus in warming because we knew from earlier studies going back to the 1980s that the Pacific Ocean, for example, could oscillate between two very extreme states in which the temperature changes dramatically. And you'll notice that uh, El Nino is a warm state and La Nina is a, a cool state. And so perhaps what was happening was that we were switching uh, from El Nino to La Nina, a pre prevailing state thereof. So I have to tell you a little bit, just a little bit, about how the uh, El Nino cycle works. So what you're looking at here is a picture taken from the sketch taken from the Pacific Equator, uh, stretching from the east in Lima to the west in Darwin. And uh, you'll see at the top in the La Nina phase that trade winds push the wavy ocean uh, towards the west. Uh, and uh, that water heats up from the sun as it goes. And as it heats up, it expands a little bit. So the winds have to push the water upstream, uphill. And uh, it goes until it can't go any further. And uh, so you get a, a water, deep water, in the uh, western Pacific that's warm. And then this circulation pattern pushes up cold water in the east. And that's the cooling phase of the La Nina. The El Nino is a little bit different. Uh, the trade winds uh, can suddenly stop for some reason, and then all this water rushes downhill, and the warm water gets heated a second time as it crosses the uh, Pacific, and you uh, slosh up against uh, uh, the North American and South American continents. So what happened? Did the trade winds increase? And were of the right sense to create an El Nino, a La Nina? And the answer is, uh, from this remarkably difficult data set to, to compile, 100 years of the trade wind stress on the ocean water in the Central Pacific. And you can see it oscillated around until about the year 2000, when it switched from El Nino sense, smaller trade wind, to La Nina sense, larger trade wind. It's continuing to get larger in the negative direction. You, that's the negative part of this curve. And it's unprecedentedly large. And it is not included at present in contemporary climate models. But the trade wind has been exceptionally large, which means then you would, you would think, if that were the case, that in fact you were driving a lot of heat energy uh, into the ocean in the Western Pacific. So here is a a picture uh, of uh, ocean heat content that was published just about six or seven months ago in science, but it looks like it solves the problem. And what Chen and Tang did was divide their time that they looked at the data from before the hiatus on the right and after the hiatus began on the left. And you see two plots. The bottom one is the one pertinent to the, my argument about the El Nino. And I'll come to the top one in a moment. Uh, what you see uh, is a spread against longitude across the Pacific. The red blob is the distribution of ocean heat down to about 300 meters. And you see this abrupt switch in uh, colors, if you will, the same switch that you saw in that earlier picture from uh, Woods Hole. So what we do know is that uh, at around the time of the hiatus, the Pacific Ocean state changed to a heat sequestering state. But the other thing that happened, which actually took over after a while during this same period, was this, uh, is displayed in this plot on the left, which is somewhat different because it's a, a transect up the Atlantic from south to north, uh, and it shows you where in the heat is being, new heat is being buried in the North Atlantic. And you can see, basically, uh, that the heat is being buried at pretty high latitudes. And this started at approximately the same time. And this little event here that we are observing is a small version of the events that Jeff Severinghaus was talking about somewhat earlier, where it was possible to slow down the Atlantic uh, meridian circulation. And you can see the uh, strong difference between the two states. And this change took place 
across the uh, large El Nino that started the, the process off. So what else was going on during this time? The oceans would tell you this spread all around the Earth, all around the Earth's ocean, and that tells you right away that we're dealing with a comprehensive change in ocean state. And you would expect then that there would be other changes in the climate that occurred at the same time, other parts of this restructuring. And uh, as you uh, probably have understood from the pictures of polar bears, there actually is an Arctic regime shift in progress. And this was first revealed by two formal assessments, one in 2005 that used primarily data from before the hiatus began, and another one only seven years later, and they discovered a major change in the distribution of Arctic heating. Uh, during the hiatus, it's been fastest in spring and autumn, and before it was fastest in winter, which was consistent with the earlier greenhouse warming models. It's now faster over the oceans and the land. So these change in patterns suggested to you that the Arctic was having developed a new warming source that was not as strong uh, in the previous period. So this is... Uh, Satellite data first began to be collected with great, great, ac greatly accurate data on sea ice area in 79. And here is the <coughs> curve that you can see of the minimum sea ice extent, which occurs at the end of the warm season in September, uh, as a function of time, September after September, since 1979. And what you can f infer from this plot is a break in behavior in which the sea ice was slowly declining, but oscillating about a slowly declining mean. And suddenly, there looks like a change in state. And over this period of time, the sea ice area de has declined by about 40%. And the sea ice volume has, is down to 25% what it had been in 1979. So here's the same data. And that was there in case the movie didn't work. That shows you where the sea ice, the timing of the sea ice decline. Uh, and there's one other thing that has happened during the period of the uh, hiatus, which I think will be interesting to uh, Jeff and others. It's a small analog of the events that slow the, uh, the meridional overturning circulation. During this hiatus, and only since about the year 2000, a new pattern of winds developed over the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it's called the Arctic Dipolar Anomaly. And this pair of winds going in opposite directions drives ice and sea uh, and fresh water from the Arctic uh, into the North Atlantic, where it will shut off uh, or it can impede that, where it collides, basically, with the Gulf Stream. And at that collision point, the water sinks to depth. And we did see that. Now, this is a s small event of something that actually happened in the, in the historical record 8,000 years ago, as the ice sheet was uh, retreating across North America. Uh, as it retreated, it left behind in the area of Hudson Bay a huge glacial lake that was contained between the melting ice on the one hand and the moraine that had pushed up on the front. These glacial moraines are unstable, and there was a huge outflow of water that occurred all at once. And there was a 200-year period of cool climate that then recovered. The Columbia River was also formed this way. And what the satellites have observed is a great injection of fresh water into this gyre here, the Beaufort Gyre, that began at approximately the same time. And that water is uh, lighter. And when it gets to the saltier Atlantic, the saltier Atlantic will sink. So here's the next and the most important point. This sea ice retreat that I just documented is warming the Arctic by a very simple mechanism. Uh, when you replace white ice with blue ocean, you absorb much more uh, solar energy. Uh, the sea ice itself may reflect half back to space, and uh, the ocean absorbs, absorbs 93% of the energy that's falling on it. So as the sea ice retreats, uh, it warms the Arctic. And a recent paper that came out from Scripps uh, measured the degree of warming 
since the satellite era started in 79, and they found that the net sea ice retreat adds about six watts per meter squared, but two-thirds of the heating that uh, took place in that period occurred in the 10 years between 01 and 11. And the Arctic is small, but if you average this over the globe, you get 0.21 watts per meter squared, which is about a quarter uh, of the increase that you would have expected from the increase in greenhouse gas at that time. So you have added a new warming mechanism uh, that the climate, at least in recent times, was not used to. So the question before, this is a, a picture of the geography of heat transport in the climate. And the only, I put it on even though it's uh, complicated, just to remind you that uh, the basic circulation of the atmosphere, as understood from the time of Edmund Halley, was there was heavy and strong warming of the ocean and land over the tropics. Uh, this heat was then transported uh, to the north. So it was a north-south circulation, north pole, north equator to pole circulation that is the fundamental uh, feature of our climate transport. If you suddenly add a new energy, new heating source, at the poles, particularly the Arctic, won't you change the circulation of heat uh, in the atmosphere? And will this not, in fact, lead to states like uh, the El Nino? So what we do know, and this is a question still under active uh, uh, investigation, but what we do know is that we have created a 17 or 18 year persistent La Nina-like state in the Pacific Ocean and also a similar outflow in the North Atlantic uh, that is lasting longer than most typical La Ninas. It lasted the whole period of time. And what this has had an effect on the climate down below because when you're in a La Nina shape state, you uh, bend the jet stream as you see and you've seen many, many pictures recently. Anytime you look at the weather, you will see the jet stream dipping deep into uh, central United States. So there's a, we've remained in a state of, uh, of jet stream, uh, La Nina-like jet stream. And this, the weather patterns then correlate with this. Now the question is, the global temperature has been constant. So you would expect then that there would be very, many fewer heat waves, right? Or at least the same number as before. This has not proven the case. Here's a remarkable data analysis uh, generated in, in Spain where they were able to compile the mean summer temperature in Europe for the last 500 years, since 1500. And what you see is five of the 10 years in the 2010 were the hottest years in the 2010 decade with the hottest years on record. You also hear about this unstable, you hear this bending La Nina-like uh, jet stream, you hear about it in another context because in the winter it's brings, it brings Arctic air to the south and has been responsible for the large snowstorms that we've seen in the past. Uh, we also know that the La Nina state implies a very dry climate in California, something that we are presently observing. So here's, here are the questions. I phrase the hypothesis at a set of questions. Did the Arctic warming associated with the super El Nino, which pushed the ice over the edge, did it trigger a continuing ice retreat when winter regrowth could not make up for the previous year's loss? Did Arctic warming by altering the north-south uh, heat flow, did it strengthen the trade winds, create the La Nina bias, and enable the persistent ocean heat sequestration that we've been seeing? Did it, warming, by altering the heat flow, cause the observed pattern and enhancement of extreme event occurrence? And then finally, how long can this kind of thing go on? Will the present dynamical quasi-equilibrium be maintained until the energy added to the climate system from ice and snow retreat stops. So, thank you. <laughs>